Okay, today is the 14th of August, 2010, and we come to Majima Nikaya Sutta 64, Maha Malunkya Sutta, the greater discourse to Malunkya Putta. This sutta is also another very important sutta. Thus have I heard, on one occasion, the Blessed One was living at Savati in Jeta's Grove, Anatha Pindika's Park. There he addressed the monks thus, Monks, Prabhu Sir, they replied. The Blessed One said, Monks, do you remember the five lower fetters as taught by me? When this was said, the Venerable Malunkya Buddha replied, Prabhu Sir, I remember the five lower fetters as taught by the Blessed One. But Malunkya Buddha, in what way do you remember the five lower fetters as taught by me? Venerable Sir, I remember identity view as a lower factor taught by the Blessed One. I remember doubt as a lower factor taught by the Blessed One. I remember adherence to rules and observances as a lower factor taught by the Blessed One. I remember sensual desire as a lower factor taught by the Blessed One. I remember ill will as a lower factor taught by the Blessed One. It is in this way, Venerable Sir, that I remember the five lower factors as taught by the Blessed One. And the Buddha said, Malunkya Buddha, to whom do you remember my having taught these five lower factors in that way? Would not the wonders of other sects confute you with the simile of the infant? For a young tender infant lying prone does not even have the notion identity. So how could identity view arise in him? Yet the underlying tendency to identity view lies within him. A young, tender infant lying prone does not even have the notion teachings. So how could doubt about teachings arise in him? Yet the underlying tendency to doubt lies within him. A young, tender infant lying prone does not even have the notion rules. So how could adherence to rules and observances arise in him? Yet the underlying tendency to adhere to rules and observances lies within him. A young, tender infant lying prone does not even have the notion sensual pleasure. So how could sensual desire arise in him? Yet the underlying tendency to sensual lust lies within him. A young, tender infant lying prone does not even have the notion beings. So how could ill will towards beings arise in him? Yet the underlying tendency to ill will lies within him. Would not the wonders of other sects confute you with the simile of the infant? I'll stop here for a moment. So when Malunkya Buddha quoted the five lower factors, the Buddha said, if you say that, it's the five lower factors. Then wonders of other sects, external sects, ascetics, can prove you wrong, confute you with the simile of the infant. Uh, saying that the infant, uh, a young infant, uh, does not have the, these five uh, lower factors. Uh, yet, uh, the tendency uh, to have these five lower factors is there. Uh, um, later, the Buddha explains uh, that uh, by factor he means uh, it's a factor only if it habitually obsesses a person. Uh, Thereupon, the Venerable Ananda said, It is time, Blessed One, it is a time, Sublime One, for the Blessed One to teach the five lower factors. Having heard it from the Blessed One, the monks will remember it. Then listen, Ananda, and attend closely to what I shall say. Yes, Venerable Sir, the Venerable Ananda replied. The Blessed One said, Here, Ananda, an untaught ordinary person who has no regard for noble ones, and is unskilled and undisciplined in their Dhamma, who has no regard for true men and is unskilled and undisciplined in their dhamma, abides with the mind obsessed and enslaved by identity view, and he does not understand as it actually is the escape from the arisen identity view. And when the identity view has become habitual and is uneradicated in him, it is a lower factor. Similarly, he abides with the mind obsessed and enslaved by doubt by adherence to rules and observances, by sensual lust, by ill will, and he does not understand the escape as it actually is uh, from the arisen factors. And when that factor has become habitual and uneradicated in him, it is a lower factor. Uh, 
stop here for a moment. Huh? So here the Buddha explains huh, this uh, factor huh, when uh, the mind is obsessed uh, by these factors and uh, it is habitual. Uh, so the person is habitually uh, obsessed uh, by these uh, five things. Uh, then it becomes a factor for him. Uh, a well taught noble disciple, Aryan, uh, who has regard for noble ones and is skilled and disciplined in their Dhamma, who has regard for true men and is skilled and disciplined in their Dhamma, does not abide with the mind obsessed and enslaved by identity view. He understands as it actually is the escape from the arisen identity view. And identity view together with the underlying tendency to it is abandoned in him. Similarly, he does not abide with the mind obsessed and enslaved by doubt, by adherence to rules and observances, by sensual lust, by ill will. And he understands as it actually is the escape from arisen factor, from the arisen factor. And the factor together with the underlying tendency to it is abandoned in him. Uh, so, uh, stop here for a moment. So, for the Aryan disciple, uh, he understands the Dhamma, the Aryan Dhamma, the Dhamma of true men. And these uh, five lower factors uh, uh, is abandoned. Even the underlying tendency uh, to it is abandoned. There is a path, Ananda, a way to the abandoning of the five lower factors, that anyone, without coming to that path, to that way, shall know or see or abandon the five lower factors. This is not possible. Just, and just as when there is a great tree standing possessed of hardwood, it is not possible that anyone shall cut out its hardwood without cutting through its bark and sapwood. So too there is a path. Uh, there is a path, Ananda, a way to the abandoning of the five lower factors. As someone, by coming to that path, to that way, shall know and see and abandon the five lower factors. This is possible. Just as when there is a great tree standing possessed of hardwood, it is possible that someone shall cut out its hardwood by cutting through its bar and sapwood. So too, there is a path uh, for the abandoning of the five lower factors. Stop here. So here the Buddha says, uh, just as if you want to extract uh, the hardwood uh, of a tree, uh, which is at the core of the tree, the center of the tree, uh, you have to cut through the bark uh, and the sapwood and the softwood uh, before you can take out the hardwood. Uh, uh. So in the same way, the Buddha says, uh, to abandon the five lower factors, uh, there is a specific path. Uh, uh, and if you don't walk that specific path, uh, it is impossible. Uh, to abandon the five lower factors. Suppose Ananda, the river Ganges were full of water right up to the brim so that crows could drink from it. And then a feeble man came thinking, by swimming across the stream with my arms, I shall get safely across to the further shore of this river Ganges. Yet he would not be able to get safely across. So too, when the Dhamma is being taught to someone for the cessation of identity, if his mind does not enter into it and acquire confidence, steadiness and decision, then he can be regarded like the feeble man. Suppose Ananda, the river Ganges were full of water right up to the brim so that crows could drink from it. And then a strong man came thinking, by swimming across the stream with my arms, I shall get safely across to the further shore of this river Ganges. And he would be able to get safely across. So too, when the Dhamma is being taught to someone for the cessation of, his, of identity, if his mind enters into it and acquires confidence, steadiness and decision, then he can be regarded as like the strong man. Sorry for a moment. Nah. So here the Buddha says, nah, just like a weak man nah, is, uh, cannot swim across the Ganges nah, because it is quite a wide river, but a strong man can. Nah. So in the same way, the Buddha says, uh, when the Dhamma is taught, uh, if a person uh, does not pay full attention uh, and uh, if the mind does not enter into it uh, and acquire confidence, steadiness and decision, uh, then he can be regarded like the feeble man. Uh, he cannot achieve uh, what he aims to do. Uh, uh, whereas the other person, uh, uh, if he listens to the Dhamma and the mind enters into it and acquires confidence, steadiness and decision, then he can be regarded like the strong man who can swim across the river. So 
listening to the Dhamma with careful attention, uh, full attention, uh, and understanding the Dhamma is very important. And what Ananda is the path, the way to the abandoning of the five lower fetters. Here, with seclusion from objects of attachment, with the abandoning of unwholesome states, with the complete tranquilization of bodily inertia, quite secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states, a monk enters upon and abides in the first jhana, which is accompanied by applied and sustained thought, with delight and pleasure born of seclusion. Whatever exists therein of material form, feeling, perception, volition and consciousness, he sees those states as impermanent, as suffering, as a disease, as a tumor, as a barb, as a calamity, as an affliction, as alien, as disintegrating, as void, as not self. He turns his mind away from those states and directs it towards the deathless element thus. This is the peaceful, this is the sublime, that is the stilling of all volitions, the relinquishing of all attachments, the destruction of craving, dispassion, cessation, nibbana. Standing upon that, he attains the destruction of the taints. But if he does not attain the destruction of the taints, then because of that desire for the Dhamma, that delight in the Dhamma, with the destruction of the five lower factors, he becomes one due to reappear spontaneously in the pure abodes, and there attain final Nibbana without ever returning from that world. This is the path, the way to the abandoning of the five lower factors. Uh, stop here for a moment. Uh. So here, uh, the path uh, which is absolutely necessary uh, to the abandonment of the five lower factors uh, starts with the first jhana, the Buddha says. Uh, when a person attains the first jhana, then he can see uh, that the five aggregates, uh, basically the body and the mind, uh, are uh, impermanent, suffering, a disease, a tumor, a barb, a calamity, etc. Then uh, he becomes um, uh, dispassionate uh, and uh, relinquishes uh, all craving uh, towards the body and the mind, uh, basically the self. Then only he can attain uh, Nibbana. And if he does not, uh, then because of the understanding of the Dhamma, he will become an anagamin and be reborn in the Sudhavasa heavens, the pure abodes, and from there attain Nibbana. Again, with the stilling of applied and sustained thought, a monk enters upon and abides in the second jhana. Uh, again, with the fading away as well of, of delight, a monk enters upon and abides in the third jhana. Uh, so this second jhana also is the path to the, to the abandoning of the five lower factors. The third jhana also is the path to the abandonment of the five lower factors. Again, with the abandoning of pleasure and pain, a monk enters upon and abides in the fourth jhana, which has neither pain nor pleasure and, pur and purity of mindfulness and equanimity. Uh, whatever exists therein of material form, feeling, perception, volition, and consciousness, he, so he sees those states as impermanent, as suffering, etc. He turns his mind away from those states and directs it towards the deathless element. This again is the path, the way to, to the abandoning of the five lower factors. Again, with the complete surmounting of perceptions of form, with the disappearance of perceptions of sensory impact, with non-attention to perceptions of diversity, aware that space is infinite, a monk enters upon and abides in the base of infinite space. Whatever exists therein of feeling, perception, volition, and consciousness, he sees those states as impermanent, as suffering, etc. He turns his mind away from those states, and directs it towards the deathless element. This again is the path, the way to the abandoning of the five lower factors. Again, by completely surmounting the base of infinite space, where the consciousness is infinite, a monk enters upon and abides in the base of infinite consciousness. Similarly, whatever exists therein of feeling, perception, volition, consciousness, he sees those states as impermanent, as suffering, etc., and turns his mind away from those states. Uh, this is the path, the way to the abandoning of the five lower factors. Again, by completely surmounting the base of infinite consciousness, aware that, that there is nothing, a monk enters upon and abides in the base of nothingness. Whatever exists therein of feeling, perception, volition, and consciousness, he sees those states as impermanent, as suffering, as a disease, etc. He turns his mind away from those states and directs it towards the deathless element. 
Uh, standing upon that, he attains the destruction of the taints. But if he does not attain the destruction of the taints, then because of that desire for the Dhamma, the delight in the Dhamma, with the destruction of the five lower fetters, he becomes one due to reappear spontaneously in the pure abodes, and there attain final Nibbana without ever returning from that world. This is the path, this is the way to the abandoning of the five lower fetters. And Malunkya put uh, this member. Ananda said, Humble sir, if this is the path, the way to the abandoning of the five lower fetters, then how is it that some monks here are said to gain liberation by mind and some are said to gain liberation by wisdom? And the Buddha said, the difference here, Ananda, is in the faculties, I say. That is what the Blessed One said. Humble Ananda was satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. So this last part, now, the Buddha confirms uh, that there are two types of liberation. One is liberation by mind, and another one is liberation by wisdom. But basically they are the same. Uh. It is not the, that the method is different. The method is both are the same. Uh, that is basically the Noble Eightfold Path. Uh. But the difference, why one uh, gains liberation by mind, uh, another one gains liberation by wisdom, the Buddha says, uh, is because there's a difference in their faculties. Uh. We find from the Sutta that uh, those Arahans uh, who were liberated uh, during meditation, uh, like the Buddha himself, uh, uh, they are said to be liberated by mind. And there are, there are two Suttas uh, which talks about the two types of Arahans. One Sutta says uh, there is an Arahan liberated by mind. Later I can give you the, the, the Sutta reference. Uh, there's one liberated by mind and the other is liberated by wisdom. And there is another sutta that says there are two types of arahans. One who is two ways liberated or both ways liberated uh, and another one is liberated by wisdom. Uh, so this means uh, the monk who is liberated by mind uh, is also the monk who is two ways liberated. Uh, when a monk is two ways liberated, uh, it means uh, he is liberated by mind and by wisdom. Because without wisdom, uh, you cannot attain liberation. Uh. It's just that uh, liberation by mind, uh, actually, from the suttas we find, uh, are those who meditate uh, using the strength of mind. Uh, they meditate, uh, and then after that, uh, they attain enlightenment, like the Buddha. Uh. And there are others, uh, uh, like Venerable Sariputta. He was listening to a discourse by the Buddha. And uh, during the, the hearing of the discourse, uh, he understood uh, and he became uh, arhan, became liberated. Uh, so this uh, liberation by wisdom uh, uh, is uh, not during meditation. But somebody like Venerable Sariputta, you can see in Majjhima Nikaya Sutta 111, uh, he has all the jhanas, uh, all the jhanas. Uh, it's not that people who are liberated by wisdom uh, do not have jhanas. There is a commentarial uh, uh, idea, uh, a lot of things. Uh, uh, in the commentaries, uh, contradict the suttas. Uh. So here from this sutta, what is very important uh, is that uh, to attain the uh, abandoning of the five lower factors. When you abandon the five lower factors, uh, you become an anagamin, uh, a third fruit, arya. Uh. So here you can see, uh, uh, without uh, the jhanas I mentioned here, it is impossible. Uh, to abandon the five lower factors and become an anagamin. Uh, so there are some other suttas uh, where the Buddha says, uh, for anagamin, attainment of anagamin, third fruit, uh, and arahanhood, uh, fourth fruit, uh, you need uh, the four jhanas. Perfect samadhi, perfect concentration in the Buddha's teachings uh, are the four jhanas. Uh, uh, and uh, for the others, like uh, uh, sakadagamin, the second fruit, uh, uh, you don't need perfect uh, concentration. You don't need the four jhanas, but you may need the you you, you may need to get uh, the first jhana or the second jhana or the third jhana uh, before you can become a sakadagamin. Uh, uh, but for the uh, third and fourth, uh, you need four jhanas. Uh, so, in, in, because of this uh, this point, uh, I say this sutta is very important. That it's impossible to become an anagamin or arahana without the jhanas. Uh, 